So we're in chapter 2. Um, we're about a quarter of the way through chapter 2. And we're talking about closed loop configurations of op amps. Um, one that we had looked at last time was this. We were analyzing the closed loop configuration uh, for an inverting type op amp. And the reason why I started with this slide is just because it gives such a great summary of how to do this analysis. Right, step one, two, three, four, five, six. Right, we start off very quickly by applying our virtual short between the inverting and non-inverting terminals of the op amp. Since this terminal is grounded, we know that there's a virtual ground or zero volt potential here. Then we calculate the current flowing along the input, which is VI minus zero over RI, sorry, yeah, RI, or R1, whatever they call it. We then know that or assume that no current flows into the op amp. This is step number four. This is because of one of the ideal characteristics of uh, an op amp. We then calculate the current flowing along the feedback path, which KCL tells us is exactly the same. And then the last step is to use KVL and VO equals zero minus the voltage drop across this. So I2 times R2, which we substitute in with VI over R1, and that gives us our output. Yes? I think we mentioned it last class, but I just can't remember. Well, how do you know that I2 is equal to I1 if they have different resistors? So that's actually, the resistance doesn't come into play because we're using KCL. Okay. So what we're saying is that um, I1 plus this current equals this current, equals I2. Because we know that this current is zero, this is an infinite impedance, it's an open circuit, so there's nothing flowing, KCL tells us that this must be equal to that. There's only one path for the current to flow along. And anyway, that gives us our closed loop gain for the inverting type op amp. We also talked about this expression here, which you don't have to memorize, but you do, know have to, you do have to know how to use. And this defines the closed loop gain for the case where the A value, the open circuit gain, is infinite. So one thing that maybe I didn't touch upon last time that we do want to keep clear is open circuit gain, uh, sorry, open loop, I apologize, sometimes I say open circuit instead of open loop. The open loop gain versus the closed loop gain, right? The open loop gain is just talking about the triangle inside, the, the amplifier itself, the component by itself. The closed loop gain is taking into account all the resistances that are around it. So in the beginning of the chapter, they, they use A to represent the open loop gain and G to represent the closed loop gain. Later on, they stop doing that, but I'll, I'll point that out. But anyway, so for the, the beginning, we can, we can assume A is open loop gain, G is closed loop gain. It's very important to understand that difference, because if you don't, then when you start getting into these types of, you know, using this equation, it's all be, going to become muddy in your head. Well, what's A? What's G? What am I actually trying to find? Okay, now we're going to jump into an example. Um, and so this is one that we're not going to break out the iPad for. It's, it's more of a demonstration than an example where we're going to have a lot of math to uh, employ. It asks us, so we have an inverting op amp with a, an R1 value of 1,000, an R2 value of 100,000. All right. And it says, we want the closed loop gain for the cases below. And the cases are open loop gain, not being infinite. 10,000, 100,000, million. Right, 10, 3, 10, yeah, 10,000, 100,000, million. Okay. And so um, this means that we're going to have to use this equation here. Right, because we have a non-ideal case. Our value of A is not infinite. And so uh, we're going to employ that. And then it asks us some other questions. So I'll come back to that in a second. Let's first take a look at the 
the beginning of this table. So this table is just calculated using the equation that I just demonstrated. So we have here the independent variable for what we're looking at, which is the open loop gain A. It's 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, million. The values of R1 and R2, they don't change. They're always 1,000 and 100,000. Then we calculate what the ideal gain is. The ideal gain doesn't change because it's, it's ideal. So it's uh, negative 100,000 over 1,000, negative 100. Now the interesting comparison here is between this column and this column. The actual gain, now this is what we're going to calculate using that equation with the A in the denominator. So I didn't show the math, but I mean I just I calculated it using Excel or something like that. So now what happens is that as A gets larger, the difference between this and this gets smaller, which makes sense because if we keep running this up bigger, 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 then we get closer to our ideal case. Now let's take a look at where the line is between good use of the ideal versus bad use of the ideal. I said that ideally we should have a two order of magnitude difference between A and 1 plus R2 over R1. Remember that's our test for determining whether we can use the ideal or the non-ideal. A should be much larger than 1 plus R2 over R1. This is a qualitative or a non, you know, concrete comparison right here. What is much, much bigger? I'm going to, again, say that I think that a good rule of thumb is 100 times difference. Two order of magnitude difference. So let's look at how that plays out here. 1 over R2 over R1 is 100. It's actually 101, but we can just go ahead and say 100. Okay, so what's the difference between here and 1 plus R2 over R1? It's a factor of 10. 1,000 is 10 times bigger than 100. How do these compare? It's a 10% difference almost in the gain. That's, I think, pretty noticeable. If we jump down one line, now we have 100 times difference, right? Because 10,000, 100 times bigger than 100. And now we have negative 99 and negative 100. Seems like a pretty good approximation. So I would say from this point down, we're sort of okay with just going with the ideal gain. But again, it really depends on your application where you draw that line. So as you expect, it gets better and better, closer to the uh, ideal gain as we go down, downward. The percentage error is simply just going to be ideal minus actual over ideal, right? Hopefully that calculating percentage gain is nothing new to this, app, to this example. It's just a general equation. 10% difference, 1%, 0 0.1, 0 0.01 goes, gets less as we move downward as you would expect. The last thing here is the value of V1. So what is V1? Again, V1 is the voltage at the non-inverting terminal, which for the inverting op amp should be ideally zero. But remember that all of our assumptions, or this analysis here, is based on the assumption that the A value is infinite. We don't have that anymore. So that's the last question, what it asks. How does this value change? I mean, it gets larger and deviates from our virtual short. How do we calculate it? We can actually calculate it using the ratio of the ideal closed loop and the actual open loop gains. So this is another equation you'll see on your, on your cheat sheet. And it's just a matter of understanding how to, to use it. Now, um, so we take this equation, we apply it in the table, and we get this. So the voltage gets smaller as we move towards the ideal case, which again is what we would expect. So this example is more about 
demonstrating the effect of A than it is about doing any real calculation. This is homework number three. Again, do a, home, uh, a week from today. Uh, I'm not going to collect the homework today. I am going to collect it at some point. So please, I do ask you continue to bring it with you on the day that it's due. Again, doing a little bit and doing it for comprehension is better than worrying about doing a lot. Yes? So for this type of problem, they would have to give you A, or else it wouldn't make any, I mean, the problem wouldn't make any sense. And again, you know, for this class in general, you always assume it's ideal unless they tell you that it's not ideal, right? A is infinite, input in, uh, resistance is infinite, output resistance is zero, unless they tell you that it's, that it's not. Yes? And that equation you gave on the previous slides for V1, hmm? when it's not virtual ground, you only use when A is virtual ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but actually it still works out regardless because if you go back here, it would, it, it would put it to zero, right? Yeah, so it works, it works either way. And that's a good way of testing whether you understand any equation, right? Whether it's this or any, you know, the, the non-ideal gain equation. Look at the limits. Look at what happens when you get to your ideal case or when you go down to zero. You know, it should approach what you expect to happen. If it doesn't, then you know that there's something weird with the way with your understanding or with the way that it's written or, or something along those lines. Okay. So input resistance for the inverting op-amp. Well, what does this question mean? We know what the input resistance is. It's infinite, ideally. Again, we have to draw a distinction, just like we have to say that there's a difference between the open loop gain and the closed loop gain. There's a difference between the open loop input resistance and the closed loop input resistance because Looking here, don't worry about the top part of the circuit for the moment, for the time being. The input resistance for the open loop is observed from here. The input resistance for the closed loop is observed from here. So they're different values because we're observing them from different points. We're applying the input at different points, whether we're talking about the closed loop or the open loop. So the question we're asking on the previous slide is, what is the input resistance for the inverting op amp? It's not infinite even when we have an ideal op amp. It's R1. So it's that series resistor, the one that's in series with the, the input that we're applying. Um, so how do we calculate that? We can always calculate input resistance. We talked about this in chapter one. As the ratio of the input voltage over the input current. The input voltage is just simply itself. The input current is ideally V in minus zero, right, if we're assuming a virtual short right here, over R1. So it's V in over R1. So we plug that in. These will get canceled out, and we'll end up with 1 over 1 over R1, which is R1. So this right here, this little mini analysis, shows us that this works. Now, what does this say? It tells us that we have some decisions to make when we're designing an inverting type op amp. You still have to be concerned with the impedance matching between the source and the input. You want the input resistance to be much higher than the source resistance. So then, well, the obvious solution is I'll just go pick the biggest, amp, the biggest resistor out of the bin that I can get, and I'll use that as the, as the R1, right? Problem solved. What other problems that introduced, though? R1 is in the expression for gain. It's in the denominator, which means the bigger you make R1, the lower the gain is going to get. Okay, well, I have another solution. I'll just go get an even bigger resistor, and I'll set that as the RF. Right? So if I use 1 mega ohm or 10 mega ohm as R1, I'll set my R2 or RF, whatever we call it, as like some ridiculous value, 1,000 mega ohms. It doesn't work. Uh, there is a limit right to the, 
to the linear region of the amplifier and what feedback resistances will work. I'm not going to go into the details, but it has to do with the amount of current flowing along the feedback path and the bias current consumed by the input of the amplifier. Once you make the feedback current very low, all your ideal assumptions start to melt away because you can no longer assume that the input current to the, to the amplifier is zero, and so it, that's not a viable solution. So there is a balance between in, that involves R1. We want to set it large because we want to ensure that we're properly matching our impedance to the source, but not so large that it drives the gain down to you know, a non-usable value. The next example, actually though, gives us another way of looking at this. Um, and potentially a way or to circumvent the problem altogether. But I'll talk about that at the end. So how are we going to address this type of problem, finding the closed loop gain for a network that is relatively unknown, right? We don't know what the answer is for this right off of the bat. We're going to apply the same steps that we've used in all of the previous examples. This is the most important part of addressing this type of problem, is knowing what the steps are. Number one, we're going to apply all the assumptions that are associated with the ideal amplifier, the virtual short between the two input terminals, which comes from the fact that we want to get a finite output from an infinite open loop gain. Right? We also have the assumption that there's no current flowing into the, uh, the amplifier terminals. And so once we do that, what we can do is really just cut this amplifier out of the picture altogether, and what we'll be left with is a network that we can solve using our basic ENG212 uh, characteristics or uh, tools. So what I'm going to do in this one is I'm going to start from the end and I'm going to work backwards. There's as many ways to address this type of problem as there are, you know, um, boxes of cereal, breakfast cereal in the, in the supermarket. Uh, not a very good analogy, but anyway, there's every different way that you can do this, right? You could use nodal analysis, you could use mesh analysis, um, and then obviously there's a billion different ways that you could, you could combine KVL and KCL together. So this is one way of doing it, but I really think that, again, going back to the issue of being good at those circuit analysis techniques, that's still something you need to practice, still a skill that you need to hone. Okay, so we're going to start from the output. Um, we assume that we want a finite output from an infinite gain, right? V out over infinity equals V2 minus one, V1 equals zero. So we have a virtual short. So you can see I drew the assumptions in green. So this is our virtual short right here. Step number two. Now what we're going to do is we are going to define VO in terms of VX working backward along the output path or the feedback path. So we know V out is equal to VX minus the drop across R4, so VX minus I4 R4 gives us our V out. Now later, we're going to use this version, permutation of it right here, but we haven't gotten to that yet. We'll see why that permutation will be useful. All right, let's keep working backwards. So what's the next thing that we can solve for working backwards along this path? Essentially, what is Vx? So what is Vx? Let me ask you that, that question. Now, we could solve for Vx in terms of V1, but we want to, if we're using this methodology of working backwards, we want to address this path right here. So we have a current I3, we have a voltage Vx, and we have a resistance R3. Ohm's law should apply here, right? So what's the equation? Vx is equal to? Yes. 
That's very important, the negative. I know I, know I wrote it up here. But um, why is it negative? Which is, yes, that ultimately is the reason. But to clarify that a little bit more, going through the negative terminal or the current flowing from the negative to the positive terminal means that it's not obeying the passive sign convention. Okay? Um, doesn't, that's, this, this means doesn't satisfy the passive sign convention. Normally, right, our passive sign convention says that current flows from the positive to the negative terminal and therefore V equals I times R. We have the current flowing in the opposite direction, so we have to throw in the negative. If I were you and I were doing this problem, I would probably just flip the sign of I3 since we already were defining these conventions you know, ourselves. But since this is a, an example, I left it like this just to throw a little bit more, a slight amount of complication into the problem. Okay, so that leaves us with our second expression, and that is uh, that right here. Vx equals negative I3 R3. Okay, now we're going to keep stepping backwards and we're going to look for the next previous value that we don't know. Um, and we see we can apply KCL at our node Vx. And so if we apply that, what we'll see is that I2 plus I3 equals I4. Right, the sum of the currents entering the node equals the, the sum of the currents leaving the node. And so that's the next expression that we use right here. Again, when you ask, why is that the next expression that you defined? Okay, why not have this be the next expression you defined? Working backwards would also imply that you would derive Vx from V1. Again, there's a million different ways to do this. What we're trying to do is just put together all the relevant expressions that define this circuit. Because in the end, to get our gain expression, we're going to have to combine them together in, in the right way. Okay, so we apply KCL. Now we can apply KVL, working backwards. So that's sort of, when I say working backwards, it's sort of this, this oscillation back and forth. We apply KVL. We apply on a branch, then we apply KCL at the node. Then we apply KVL at the next branch, then apply KCL at the next node. <clears throat> so now, applying KVL to the next, or what we could say is the previous branch, we have Vx equals V1 minus the drop across R2. That's this branch here. And we know that our voltage V1 is equal to zero, and that leaves us with negative I2 R2. We could, there's a little mini step in here that I left out. We could apply KCL to this branch, I mean to this node, but it doesn't give us a very interesting answer because we know there's no current flowing into the amplifier, therefore, right, I1 is equal to I2. So we'll skip applying KCL, and we'll jump straight into applying KVL. And so KVL tells us that V1 equals VI minus the voltage drop across that resistor right there. We know that V1 is equal to zero. And so the most interesting way to look at this, instead of setting it equal to V1, is actually to flip everything around and set it equal to I1. So I1 equals V in minus V1 over R1. That goes away, and we're left with this. And all this is saying right here, we apply our ideal assumption that the input resistance to the open loop amplifier is equal to zero, which is the same as that green arrow pointing to the right saying that current equals zero. Okay. Now, step seven. This is not an easy step right here, relatively. 
um, because we have a whole bunch of expressions, let's say between five and seven expressions that describe the circuit, but ultimately we need to get V out over V in. So there's several different ways of doing this. You could start out with V out and back substituting. What I did was I just, go, I just went ahead and set up my, my ratio, V out over V in, and I used two of the expressions that I had at my disposal. One of the first expressions we came up with was V out is equal to Vx minus I4 over R4. And then one of the final expressions we came up with was Vn is equal to I2 over R1. Now this is correct, okay. And this gives us the, the, the transfer function for the uh, amplifier, except, right, it's, a, it's defined in, in tons of terms that are, uh, tons of parameters that are unknown, okay. What in what terms do we want to have our transfer function, right? We want it to be defined in terms of simply just the known values, which are the resistances. So our goal is to have V out over V in equals some function of only known values. Therefore, we can calculate what the, the gain is. So, like I said here in the blue, now we want to remove as many unknowns as possible per step. For example, let's try to get rid of Vx and put both Vx and I4 in terms of I2. So it's a little bit of a game. What you're doing is you're saying, okay, I have three unknowns here, Vx, I2, I4. Let's look for an expression that puts one of those three into terms of the others, right? Because that gives us a better chance of eliminating it altogether. So can we put Vx in terms of I4? Can we put Vx in terms of I2? Can we put I4 in terms of I2? It's, it's a game, right? We're trying to find the ways that we can um, to reduce the number of unknowns. So if we look back up top, we'll see that here and here, there's actually two good expressions that we can use that will put both Vx and I4 in terms of I2. Unfortunately, the second one gives us I2 and I3, but at least now we go from three unknowns, one, two, three, to just two unknowns, one and two. So we're moving in the right direction. You're in many cases, not going to be able to solve this in, in one step. Now, where do those expressions come from? When I, I've already posted this online, you can go and actually I, I have little green arrows that show where we pulled the individual expressions from. All right, so we make that substitution and then we rearrange. What I did was I grouped by are unknowns, I2, I3, I2. Now the obvious strategy here, since now we have two terms that have a matching unknown coefficient, the obvious strategy is try to get this I3 and put it in terms of I2. So we want to try to put I3 in terms of I2 since this seems to be the most present unknown variable. Maybe it will cancel out, question mark, right? Because if we can put this in terms of I2, boom, 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 all of those will go away, and then we'll be left with something only in terms of I2, uh, well, only in terms of the known values. So we'll start off by using I2 equals, oh, sorry, we cannot use I2 equals I4 minus I3, again, because that would be redundant. So what we want to do when we're doing the substitution is we want to stay away from expressions that we've already used. Because then what ends up happening is you end up going in a cycle, right? You make a substitution, then you make the opposite substitution, then you make the substitution again, and you're just going around in circles. So one way that we could put I3 in terms of I2 would be to use this. But since we already used it up here, it's not really going to help us. So let's find another expression, a different expression, that can help us put I3 in terms of I2. And the main one that would help us is 
this right here. Vx equals negative I3 R3. Now, this may not get rid of, uh, well, may not put this in terms of I2 right away, but if we look above, we'll see, or sorry, look below. We see that if we make the substitution for negative Vx over R3, we then have another substitution for Vx in terms of I2 that came from our, from our KVL. All the way here. Step number five. Step number five. So we're going to use this substitution in combination with this substitution. So that is, this will give us something in terms of Vx. So we go from I3 to Vx, then Vx to I2, and then we can substitute out. So we make the first substitution, putting I3 in terms of Vx. We make the second substitution, putting Vx in terms of I2. And then now we can cancel out. This goes away, that goes away, that goes away, and we're left with this. Negative R2 over R1, negative R4 over R1, R2, R4 over R1, R3. And all the negatives, I just pulled them out front. So, for better or for worse, these are the type of problems that you just have to, you have to practice with, right? Going over more of them, getting used to the algebra again. Um, and I would say for an exam problem, you know, the key, like I always say, is trying to get as many, trying to get as much partial credit as possible. So, if you can start off the problem well, Set up the ideal characteristics and the assumptions, the virtual short, the fact that there's no bias current, right? And start the, start the solution process. Even if you make some mistakes along the way, you can still do relatively well in the problem, okay? The key is not just starting off without a plan, right? Here I had a strategy of working from the end uh, and moving backwards. That may not have been the best strategy, but at least it was a strategy that allowed me to methodically come up with the expressions and then try to do the substitutions at the end. So are there any questions on this one? This is a, a good example of finding the closed loop gain of an amplifier that's not one of the common, um, the common configurations that we've seen before. So this is posted, and uh, yeah, I recommend you take a look at it when you have a chance. All right, so back to our lecture notes or the PowerPoints. The solution is also done out in a slightly different way in the lecture notes. If you're looking for an alternative approach to the problem, where really the only difference is the order in which the algebra is done, you could take a look at this. And in the end, we get the same answer. So before I move on to the next slide, let me ask, the, the question. In the very beginning, we were talking about the inverting op amp and the trade-off, the problem we had with R1, right? That we could only push the R1 value so high, improving our input impedance, 
without having a negative or a detrimental effect on our gain. Because again, R1 is in the denominator there. What about this? So for this configuration, the input impedance is still equal to R1. Okay, we actually showed that in the very beginning. However, can we get a high gain with a very relatively large value of R1? This term, no. This term, no. But this term, yes. Because what we can do is we can counteract the effect of R1 by making R3 smaller. So that is the takeaway from this design. I mean, again, it's not some really common design. Uh, I haven't seen it used in practice a whole lot or anything like that. But um, it is an interesting variation on the inverting op amp that now gives us this additional degree of freedom and so we can use R3 in order to boost the gain while keeping R1 relatively high as the input resistance. So if you look at the way the, the question in the book was posed to us, they actually posed it in a very specific way. What they said was, we wanted to get a gain of uh, 100, and we could have no resistance value greater than 1 mega ohm, and the third requirement is that R1 had to be 1 mega ohm. So R1 is 1 mega ohm, and then all we have to do, this is actually an under-constrained problem, meaning that there's more than one solution that could, uh, that could solve this. So we want this to be equal to 100, or negative 100. R1 has to be 1 mega ohm, and so now figure out what the remaining three values are. Um, so there's different answers that would satisfy it. What I did was, for the sake of simplicity, I just went ahead and defined R2 and R4, both as 1 mega ohm also, and then that just left one value that we had to solve for, which was the corresponding R3. And so again, you can see here a relatively small R3 value makes up for the relatively large R1 value boosting the gain. Now, why does this work? Why does this work? We know, well, let me first ask you, what role does R1 play? We talked about this when we introduced the inverting op amp. The feedback resistance facilitates the feedback, right? It's the voltage drop across this resistor that actually facilitates the feedback. What's the role of the R1? We said that it regulated the feedback, right? It controlled how much current flows along this path because, right, all the current must flow like this. Therefore, a larger value of R1 would reduce the amount of current that would flow along that path, reducing the negative feedback. But R3, what it does is it provides an additional path for the, for the negative feedback current to flow. The negative feedback current doesn't have to flow all the way back to this terminal. All we're really concerned with is the voltage drop along this negative feedback path. So even though the current here is shunted to ground halfway along the path, it still, right, increases the voltage drop we see across R4 and then therefore um, uh, increases our, our, our gain or the absolute value of our gain. All right, so now moving forward, we're going to look at a couple of different uh, op amp based configurations that we may not have seen before. One is the weighted summer. So this is a closed loop amplifier configuration which provides an output voltage that is equal to the weighted sum of the inputs. A lot of these configurations perhaps had a lot greater applications before digital technology was so um, prevalent, right? Uh, let's say 40, 50 years ago when we were relying more on analog control systems. Let's say we had a PID controller, right? 
proportional integral derivative. Uh, the, the, the terms of the PID controller need to be summed together. So how would we do that in an analog form before we could just simply write in the microcontroller or whatever we're using, you know, term X plus term Y plus term Z? Before that, we used to use a weighted summer. So what this does is it accepts multiple inputs, V1, V2, all the way down to Vn, and it has multiple input series resistances, R1, R2, all the way down to Rn. So what you'll see is that we've renamed our RF value, which we used to call R2, but now we have an R2 over here. So we're going to call this our feedback resistance. So we have R1 through Rn, and we have our feedback resistance. The configuration, ultimately, is based off of an inverting op-amp, again, because we are applying our input to the inverting terminal. So what does the output look like? This right here. The coefficient of each input is different. That's what the term weighted means. So what we can have is negative 3 times V1 plus negative 2 times V2 plus uh, 0.1 times V3. Anyway, you get the idea. And the way that we control that coefficient is by the associated series input resistance. The coefficient for each input is equal to RF over its respective Rn value. So V1 times RF over R1. V2 times RF over R2, going all the way down the line. Right? And we end up with an expression that looks like this up top. So the smaller we make our Rn value, the larger the coefficient, or the, the larger the absolute value of that coefficient will be. Any questions on that? We're not going to, for a lot of these other configurations, we're not going to go through and derive the gain of each one. Although I think there's a homework problem that does ask you to derive the gain for this one. But um, right, we're not going to go through in class and derive each one. This one should look very familiar, right? We've talked about this a million times, the non-inverting op-amp configuration. And so this is one that uses, again, external resistances to affect voltage gain. It's, right, close of configuration. There's no need to, to spend too much time on this. You have seen it before. The main difference between the inverting and the non-inverting is simply that we are going to apply the input voltage to the non-inverting terminal. So we used to have it switched. For the inverting op-amp, the input is applied here, and this is grounded. Now we, we flip them. Um, same thing as before, R2 facilitates the feedback, R1 regulates the amount of feedback. You can also look at this as a voltage divider, R2, uh, sorry, R1 over R1 plus R2, which um, determines the, the feedback voltage. We're not going to go through and derive all the different values um, for this. I'll just give them to you in like a table sort of form here. So the ideal gain is 1 plus R2 over R1. This is with the assumption that the, right, what does this mean right here? A, the open loop gain for the op amp that we're using. If it's much, much greater than 1 plus R2 over R1, we can use this ideal expression here. The non-ideal gain applies when A is not that large. Okay, so we use this other form here. We can also calculate the percent gain error and the potential at the inverting input. This, these are all values very similar to uh, what we got. Or, the ones that we displayed for the inverting. So the next configuration that we're going to talk about is a very easy one. Voltage follower. Um, voltage follower configuration shown here. 
we apply the input to the non-inverting terminal. We loop the um, feedback back around to the inverting terminal. And what we end up with is V out is equal to V in. So a gain of 1. Here is a, a circuit-based model representation of it. So why would we ever want to use this, right? It has several names, buffer, voltage follower. Yeah. Well, if you're low, you need a lot of current that your source can supply. Exactly, right? The main difference between hooking a load up here and hooking a load up directly to the source or whatever signal is that you're measuring is that over here, the current that is supplying the load is not coming from the input path, right? Again, this, this, this gain is, uh, this current is very small. It's coming from the positive and negative supplies that are provided to the amp. So, <clears throat> if you're trying to observe a portion of a system without affecting it significantly, I mean, there's always going to be some effect because in reality, this, this current is not zero. It's just a very small current. You can use a voltage follower in order to, to do that. So what we'll, we'll see is that this will play an important role in designing something called an instrumentation amplifier. Um, but it's a good first stage um, of a cascaded amplifier design or a multi-amplifier design when we're worried about um, drawing current or affecting our system to be observed too much. What is the input resistance for this? For the closed loop? So, there is no series resistance, therefore the input resistance is going to be the same as that for the open loop, which means ideally the gain is infinite, which is good as far as a buffer characteristic goes. Let's look back at the non-inverting op-amp. We'll see that also has a similar characteristic. Again, right, because we don't have any, any series resistance or any resistance in series with our source, again, the input resistance should be the same as that of the open loop configuration, which is good. That's a good thing. So one of the, we do see that the, the inverting op-amp has a little bit of a disadvantage, okay, because of the fact that it has this resistance in series with the input. So both the, the non-inverting as well as the buffer op-amps, they provide us a, a good input resistance characteristic. So for the buffer amp, the output voltage is equal in both magnitude and phase to the input signal. However, any current supplied to the load is drawn from the amplifier supplies, VCC and VEE, not the input source itself. Okay, next type of amplifier we're going to discuss. And what do I expect you to know about these amplifiers? That's a good question to ask. Okay, he's rattling off all these different amplifier types. How am I going to be tested on these? So first things first, these will be on your cheat sheet. So the amplifier configurations as well as some of the equations that go along with them will be on the cheat sheet. So questions in this realm will be more aimed at implementation of the equations, combining them together, you know, some variation on the problem. And you'll see in the homeworks that there are uh, some of the problems ask you to derive the closed loop gain for some of these more difficult configurations as well. Mainly, I'm pretty sure there's a homework problem that asks you to derive the closed loop gain for the summing amplifier. So a difference amplifier is a closed-loop configuration, again, which responds to the difference between two signals applied at its input and ideally rejects the signals that are common between the two. Remember in the very beginning of this chapter, we talked about a differential input versus a common mode input. Does anybody remember what the difference was between those two? So the differential input is V2 minus V1. 
right? The difference between the two. The common mode input is the average between the two. We want to amplify the differential voltage input and not, uh, ideally, eliminate the common mode input. So, right, yeah, ideally, the, the device will amplify only differential input and reject completely the common mode. And so here's what the output looks like. The output will be equal to the differential gain times the differential input plus the common mode gain times the common mode input. We want, ideally, this to go away. And if you remember back to the ideal characteristics that we defined for the amplifier, it was infinite input impedance, zero output impedance, infinite bandwidth, and then one of them was also infinite common mode rejection ratio, or complete rejection of the common mode input. What is this term that I just used? The common mode rejection ratio. It's the degree to which a differential amplifier rejects the common mode input. 20 log base 10 of the differential input over the common mode. I mean, sorry, the differential gain over the common mode gain. If this ratio is high, that means that the common mode gain is low, which is a quote-unquote good thing as far as we're concerned. <clears throat> so, the op amp by itself, open loop, is differential in nature, right? It has an inverting input and a non-inverting input. Why can't we just use it by itself? Again, because of this infinite gain, right? In, in the open loop configuration, it's not very useful. So, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a closed loop configuration that maintains the differential input characteristic or structure of the open loop amplifier, but now is a closed loop configuration where we can control the gain and, and bring it down to a finite value. So the, the schematic looks like this. We have V in 1 and V in 2, which is going to be different from our V1 and V2, which is what we've been calling the voltages at these terminals here. We have still a negative feedback path, R2, R1, but now we also have two additional resistors here, R3 and R4, associated with the non-inverting input. So one thing you'll note off the bat is that for both V in 1 and V in 2, the input resistance is not going to be equal to whatever the internal input resistance in the, for the open loop is. Right? It's going to be dependent on R1, as well as here both R3 and R4. So the difference amplifier is not going to provide us that ideal input characteristic that we potentially were looking, are looking for. So what does the gain look like? Looks like this. R2 plus R1 times R4, etc., etc., minus R2 over R1, V in 1. So what's the problem with this expression? It applies a different gain to the V in 2 and a different gain to the V in 1, which in the end is not very useful, as useful to us because we're trying to amplify the differential input, which is V in 2 minus V in 1. We want them both to have the same coefficient. Luckily, if we skip down one row, we can set R1 equal to R3 and R2 equal to R4. Now that's a, a, an active choice that we're making, right? We're, we're assuming that. If we do it that way, then this expression simplifies down to this expression here, where now we are, we do have a single coefficient or a single gain that applies to both inputs, V in 2 minus V in 1. So this is a form that we can work with. Now, what does this mean physically? If we go back to the schematic, what we're doing is we are setting both the input resistances to the same value, 
and then now the shunt resistance will be equal to the feedback resistance. So these two are the same, and these two are the same. Okay. I think I said before that there was a certain point in the textbook where they stopped using A as well as G to represent the gains. In the beginning of the chapter, A represents the open loop gain, G represents the closed loop gain. This is that point. Okay, so now they just start using A for everything. And what they'll do is employ subscripts or superscripts in order to tell you whether it's open loop gain or the gain for this given closed loop configuration or common mode gain versus differential gain. Anyway, to make a long story short, it's always going to be A. You can't rely on the, uh, the assumption that G represents the closed loop gain. Now going back to our discussion of the difference amplifier, what's one problem that we have with the difference amplifier? It does a lot of things really well. It provides us a nice range of gain. It provides a constant gain or the same gain to both VN1 and VN2, which is what we want. However, we still have this low impedance problem. And what does this mean practically? Again, the source impedance will have an effect on the gain. And another side effect is that if we try to boost the R1 and R3 values, that'll bring down our gain and we have to play that whole game again. The same thing we saw when we were talking about the inverting op amp. So what is a solution? What if we put two buffers at the input terminals, which would then transmit the voltage, but draw minimal current from the amp. So we're worried about the current being drawn from the sources here and here. Because our input resistances are not going to be very, very large. We place a buffer here, we place a buffer here, we're still getting the voltage from VN1 and the voltage from VN2, but now we're no longer drawing any current from them. And our input resistances, R1 and R3, will not have a significant effect on the gain because we can assume that the output resistance of the buffer is going to be very small. So we have, essentially this will be the load for the first stage and, and we'll have properly matched impedances. So what we'll go, what we'll use is a configuration that has three op amps as opposed to one. Now, one last question. Can we get more from this first stage of op amps, additional two, than simply just buffer, buffering? Yes, we can. We can actually get some additional gain as well. If you remember, we looked at both the non-inverting op amp as well as the buffer. Both of them provided the same ideal input characteristic, where the input impedance for the closed loop configuration was equal to the input impedance for the open loop. So if we're going to use a buffer, right, might as well use a non-inverting op-amp. It has all the advantages, and we can get some additional gain out of it. So we're going to present something called, a configuration called the instrumentation amplifier, which is composed of two different stages and three different amplifiers. Starting in the second stage, the second stage we have the difference amp with a gain that we're going to call A3. That's equal to R4 over R3. And that is going to amplify the gain, uh, sorry, the differential voltage available right here. Stage number one has two amplifiers in it. Both are non-inverting op amps. They ideally should have the same gain, right, because we're trying to maintain a balanced gain between our V1 and V2. Obviously, the gain is equal to 1 plus R2 over R1. And all we do is take the output of the non-inverting op amp and connect it as the input to the difference amp. So that's what the amplifier, what the 
aggregate or the cascaded configuration looks like. You have your difference amplifier, you have your first non-inverting amplifier, you have your second non-inverting amplifier. They share a ground at this point X. This is going to come into play a little bit later. It's going to be important. So this is what the gain looks like. V out is equal to R4 over R3 plus or times 1 plus R2 over R1 times the differential input. This is the transfer function for the instrumentation amplifier shown in figure 220. So now, what are the advantages of the instrumentation amplifier? Number one, we do have a very high input resistance, assuming that the quality of the amplifiers that we use at the input stage is good, right? Number two, we'll have a, a high differential gain. The reason we know that value will be, will be high is because we'll be multiplying not only the gain of a difference amplifier, so we'll have the gain of the difference amplifier and multiply that by the gain of the non-inverting amplifiers at the input. So that should give us an even greater gain value. Third, and this is an important one, it's a symmetric gain. Again, for a difference amplifier, we want the same coefficient of V2 and V1. Now, it's symmetric, assuming that A1 and A2 are matched. There's always going to be a little bit of an uncertainty there because, right, they are two different components using two different sets of transistors manufactured. I mean, it's all hopefully along the same line, but you get my drift. It's just like trying to find two perfectly matched, you know, um, shirts. Even if you go to Nordstrom and pull off two shirts, there are going to be minor differences between the two of them. So anyway, we're, to make a long story short, we're not worried about, we're gonna, worried about that. We're going to assume that it's symmetric or symmetric en enough. Disadvantages. Now, here's the problem. In the first stage, the differential and the common mode gains are the same. And what that means is obviously the common mode input is going to be amplified. We will not have a very high common mode rejection ratio, and that's going to produce some problems. So the easiest way to see the problem that that introduces is looking at an example like this. So let's take a look at our instrumentation amplifier. and Let's look at it in two different ways. Let's look at it as an aggregate, and then let's look at it as individual op amps, which this is the more physically accurate way of looking at it. This is sort of the way that we want it to act. Then I made up some values. Let's say that the gain for the first stage is 10, and the gain for the second stage is 25. So the total gain, 250. We can look at it as one gain, 250, or we can look at it as a gain of 10 and a gain of 25. In this representation over here, the differential gain is much higher than the common mode gain just because of the fact that we're lumping it all together as one piece. Over here, and this is the more physically accurate way of looking at it, the differential gain is equal to the common mode gain in the first stage. So what does that mean? So what happens if we make up some inputs Let's say we use 10.03 and 10.02. So 10.03 for the idealized aggregate representation. 10.03 minus 10.02 times 250. That's 0.01 times 250 gives you 2.5. No problem. That's fine. That's the way that we want it to work. For this right here, and this is something that you should be able to answer in uh, a midterm or even on the oral exam thing. It's, this is one you should memorize. 10.03, 10.02, what's the differential input? Point oh 0.01. It's not that hard. Just the difference between them, right? 10.03, 10.02, what is the common mode input? 
10.025. It's the average between the two of them, the midpoint. Okay. So now let's take a look at the more accurate version. So what happens when I apply my 10.03 here and my 10.02 down here? 10.03 will be multiplied by 10, which would ideally give me 100, but it'll saturate the amp, so we end up with 15 volts. Down here, we take 10.02, we multiply it by 10, again, it's going to saturate. That means that the voltage that will be flowing along these lines, or the voltage applied to both of these lines, will be 15. What's going to be the differential input to this stage? 15 minus 15, which is 0, which means that our output will be 0. So this is the, a good demonstration of why the common mode gain is problematic. Okay, Because the common mode gain, and it will depend on where the common mode gain is present, whether first stage, second stage, or whatever, it'll, it'll have different effects each time, but you see that the common mode gain changes the desired effect of our amplifier and produces this erroneous result. So, what do we do? Does this mean that the instrumentation amplifier is just thrown out the window, or we have to make sure that when we use it, we only apply signals that have a zero common mode input. Because the nice thing is that the common mode gain doesn't matter if the common mode input is zero. So if we were to take the 10.03 and the 10.02, we could get the same differential input by using 0.005 and negative 0.005, right? That would still give us differential input of 0.01, and now our common mode input would be 0, and this would still work. That's not going to be very useful. One main application for the instrumentation amplifier is to measure the current flowing through branches of a network. Right? What we'll do is we'll measure, we know that the current flowing through this measurement resistor will be equal to the voltage across it divided by R. So we want to measure the difference across it. And that common mode input may or may not be zero. So we need to fix this. We need to fix this problem. So how can we do that? Actually, there's a very easy fix. Let's 